we're not talking about women, the mass incarceration of women, and the effects that that, that has on, on our communities. Bonnie Bay, welcome to To the Contrary. This week, a conversation with prison reform advocate Susan Burton. She comes to her activism from personal experience, a compelling story she tells in her new book, Becoming Ms. Burton, From Prison to Recovery to Leading the Fight for Incarcerated Women. Welcome, Ms. Burton. How are you? I am good. Thank you so much, Bonnie, uh, for for having me here. You've been called a national treasure, uh, the the reincarnation of Harriet Tubman. You've won bazillions of awards for your work. Tell me about your work first and then we'll get to how you came to it. Yeah. So my work is with um, formerly incarcerated women. Um, I'm centered in uh, Los Angeles County in South Los Angeles and it's to help women make the transition transition it's to help women make the transition from prisons and jails back to the community reuniting them with their children helping them uh, enroll in higher education and uh just going to work and getting settled back into their into the community you yourself were in prison for yeah. a long time yes how long i um I was on a, in a revolving door of incarceration for uh, almost 20 years. And I just feel like had there been someone there to help me um, make the transition from prison back to the community, that I might not have recidivated. I might could have came back and uh, got, you know, acclimated back into the community and not suffered so many prison sentences and for so long. Uh, tell us about your life story. You were raped at the first time at age four, correct? Well, you know, uh, my life prior to incarceration was full of traumatic experiences, child abuse, molestation, violence, and up until the point that my son was was killed and that just kind of sent me sent me down a, a spiral of addiction and then to a car incarceration. Where were your parents when all of this was going on? So, you know, my mother and father uh, came from Texas. They left Texas looking for uh, a better life. Let me just say they ran from Texas escaping racism, uh, slavery, all of the, the, the things that was really rampant in the South, looking for, for um, a better life. And they settled in the housing projects of East Los Angeles. And um, I don't think they were actually able to understand the complications of that housing projects. Many people left the South during the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s looking for a better place, looking for a bit different life, uh, running from the South. Uh, and um, there was a different type of awareness that needed to be um, developed um, to in, in the city. So. My my mother and father were present, but there were there were just many complications and hardships. And that's not to say those complications and hardships don't exist today. Uh, the face of it has just changed. Please tell me about the violence you suffered as a child, how it affected you, and later on, how did you ever get past it? You know, we we think of violence and we talk about you know, physical violence, verbal violence, and then there's sexual violence. So, you know, I experienced all of that, and then I experienced it in a structural 
um, context that, that produced it, which I will call institutional violence. So when my mother and father was escaping from the South, what they came into was a sort of housing project that had been created by our government to contain those people who were running from the South. So I settled into this this um, violent structure that had been con constructed, in a, you know, uh, to contain people. And out of that, it produces different types of behaviors. I learned different coping mechanisms to get through and, and get by. Um, and, and most of it was about uh, putting up uh, uh, guards and um, um, uh, sort of emotional guards around me. Um, I would I would actually uh, have these experiences where I would just sort of sh turn off, turn off everything and just be void. Um, but what happened for me is that I was able to connect. I was able to find uh, resources, find uh, a, a treatment facility in a community uh, of Santa Monica, uh, wealthy, uh, white community, about three blocks from the beach. And I was able to access all the services that would put me on my path to uh, healing and recovery. What I couldn't quite grasp or understand is why these types of services existed, you know, a few miles down the 10 freeway for some people, but then over in my community, there was nothing to access like that. And that's why I set on the path to build a new way of life reentry project to reproduce what I had experienced in Santa Monica. You know, I didn't have the wealth that Santa Monica had, but I had the heart the creativity and the passion, which, you know, can make up for some of that, but we still need a, little, a few dollars. How did you get in there? Um, since it wasn't, in, did you, did somebody help you? Yes, yes. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Joe, uh, he's in the book, uh, told me about this place in Santa Monica. And uh, one of my brothers told me if I find a place, he'd pay for it for me. And that was the magic mix, uh, the direction to the place, someone to finance it for me, and then the, the, the agency that actually helped me. Well, I want to get back to your recovery in a little bit, but first let's tell our audience, how did you, what did you do to get into prison? How did you get into that cycle? And how did drugs play a role in that? So... Uh, in 1981, I had a son. My son's name was KK. His name was Mark A, and we called him KK for short. And he was um, uh, hit by a policeman and killed. In a car? In a car. My, the policeman was in the car. My son was a pedestrian. And um, after his death, I began to drink and it escalated to drug use. It was during the time of the beginning of the war on drugs, and um, drugs came into our community like a plague, just saturated with it. And I medicated my grief, I medicated my disappointment, my pain, and ultimately my rage with those drugs and they were illegal. So I was incarcerated for um, my, you know, backstreet antidepressant uh, that was illegal. And when you went to prison several times, as you mentioned earlier, yes. never for a violent crime. I always went to, to prison for the health and safety code. Of, uh, of having a controlled substance. And you know, it's really interesting now that the addiction has moved to um, other uh, areas and other people. Uh, for, for me, the drug use was a crime. Today, the op opioid use 
is a health problem. And it just speaks to me about, you know, how we address what for who. Uh, on a ra you're talking about the racial difference between... I'm talking about now that uh, addiction is moving into white areas, then it becomes a health problem. When it was in black areas, it was a criminal problem. And, you know, it's just, you know, it just changes the faces. Nothing changes. Well, how about the whole federal criminal code? I wanted to get into this later, but let's talk a bit about it now. I mean, the whole sentencing code where judges are required to give long minimum sentences for nonviolent crimes, which is filling our privatized prisons, mainly with people of color. I think the uh, whole mass incarceration, the whole idea that we're at a place where we're incarcerating people in the masses and incarcerating, you know, just criminalizing addiction, criminalizing mental health, criminalizing all across all these areas, and primarily black and brown people. But the other thing that's really interesting now is that women are the fastest growing segment of the criminal justice system. And we're not talking about women. We're not researching women. We're not looking at the effects of incarceration on communities when women are removed. I mean, women have risen seven, uh, seven, somewhere between seven and eight hundred percent in the last thirty years. And uh, you know, we're talking about young people. We're talking about men and boys of color. We're talking about men but we're not even beginning to look and talk about our research women and the mass incarceration in, of women. And I just feel like, like, like this is the last area of holding our communities together. When you remove the, the men have been removed, um, children have been incarcerated. And when you remove the women, I mean, what is left? I feel like it's the unraveling. I don't know if it's of our, I feel like it's the unraveling of our communities. You know, I'm not sure if it's strategic unraveling or not, but you know, that's something for uh, a deeper conversation of one of those think tanks or, you know, deep researchers. But, you know, there's really a problem that we're not talking about women the mass incarceration of women and the effects that that, that has on, on our communities. You know, I think that sometimes I say, you know, why is it women are always the last ones in the line to receive, you know, from, from voting rights to equal pay to all of that. And here it is. This area we're lacking also, so um, we have to kind of kind of begin to look forward, push it forward, and begin to. Uh, so I'm so thankful that you had me here today, talking about the book, uh, becoming Miss Burton, and um, putting it out there for people to begin to read. I guess if if they won't do it, you have to do it. Um, and and you have done it, and and I thank you for that. Um, now tell me, you came out, you said that in the book, I believe, that you came out of prison a worse person. What happened to you in prison? Prison, at least on some level, is supposed to be rehabilitation. Was there any of that in prison for you? Yeah. Um, so the way I experienced it and from what I understand, prisons are created in the United States for punishment and they put people there to punish them, not to, you know, it wasn't rehabilitative. It was degrading. Uh, there were experiences that were just torturous and traumatic. Uh, I remember being chained uh, line by line, chained shoulder to shoulder with other women and led out of the county jail in the dark of the night put on a bus and rolled down the highway, stripped, 
totally stripped and put in what I felt like was a corral with all the other women while we were all inspected. That was horrific and traumatic. Inspected for what? Inspected. I don't know. You know, I was in inspected leaving the county jail and re-inspected entering the uh, state prison. So, you know, I don't, I, I can't understand the reason of it, um, but I know the effect that it had. It was degrading. Uh, it was, it was harmful. Uh, it was traumatic. So I don't know what they were inspecting for. It took me all the way back to um, what I had seen and read about during the Middle Passage when people would put on boxes and turned around and their, their teeth looked at and their ears looked at and their feet looked at and their, you know, crouch looked at. You know, it took me back to the slave trade. And there was nothing you could do about it. There was nothing you I could do about it. I did what I did as a as a little girl in the violence and the trauma. You know, I turned off. I escaped. I went blank because it's just too much to have to emotionally feel what's being done to you. Um so let's move on to you get out of prison. You how did uh, you went through the program? Yeah, hundred days, right? After what did they do? Um, you know, they treated me with dignity and respect. They saw I needed help, and they extended help to me. They guided me to therapy. Uh, they guided me to the AA program. Um, I'm 20 years sober this year. Uh, they guided me to. Uh, 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 clothing and how and you know housing and food and, and work and did they, any and, training for work well I, I worked in their uh, thrift store as part of my you know pay of being there part part of my responsibility was to have a, a daily chore so my chore was a thrift store uh, but I eventually found work when I left there my brother who paid for my first month his girlfriend introduced me to a woman in our community, in the community of South LA, a older lady who needed help, Miss Andrews, and I became her live-in nurse. And that allowed me to save money to eventually create a new way of life reentry project. Now what, so a new way of life reentry project. Um, tell me, tell us about that. And you, uh, uh, out of all things, you had to become a fundraiser too if you're going to start a nonprofit, as we all know. So where did you get those skills, and how did you come up with the idea? Yeah, so I saved money uh, as a caregiver to initially get the house, and uh, when I got the house, I would go down to the bus station where the women were getting off the bus coming from prison, and I would offer them a place there. And we created. Did they all take you up on it? Not everybody did, but some people did. Before long, there were 11 of us living in a three bedroom house, and we pitched our money in together and paid the bills. We shared food, we shared resources, and created this community of women helping women. We laughed together, we cried together, um, we went to meetings together. You know, we ate together and we created this community that um, allowed us the chance. Uh, the, first, it allowed us a place to belong and and not feel like we were a burden, uh, not feel like we were unwanted. And we began to heal and we began to, you know, um, get jobs. We began to go back to school and we, everybody did different things. So tell me about the 11 women. Where are they today? Um, they're throughout the community. Some are, uh, one, one woman is a set designer for a dance studio, uh, a traveling dance, dance studio. Uh, one is a, um, a drug counselor, uh, just different. They just are different in, in different areas, different, different places. Uh, yeah, throughout the, throughout, throughout the community. And having created that 
household and that healing space. How did you tell tell your story from there on about there out about how you created? Now you have three houses, right? And five. Five. Yeah. And so, so we now have five houses, and um, early on there was a foundation who gave me a violence prevention fellowship. With the fellowship, I, I accessed a membership to the Center for Nonprofit Management. And for two years, I had a coach. And that coach taught me all of the ins and outs of um, uh, nonprofit management. And I think that for, you know, while I was, I, you know, I was able to grasp it all, I was able to understand and put the pieces in place that the organization would grow. I think it's having opportunity for people who are coming back into the community to get grounded and get a hold on their lives that their lives can actually thrive and they can become assets to the community. What we have now across America is barriers to uh, people's opportunity for to give to have an opportunity for your life to thrive. So I think we're we're really um, looking uh, backwards at a problem uh, instead of looking forward. Tell me about the barriers. What are they? Uh, barriers. And are they going to get worse? Um, uh, under I can't predict the future. I can't predict the future, but I can tell you what we're doing now and what we've done in the past. So there are barriers to, um, well, the, the, the um, Bar Association has documented 45,000 barriers for people with criminal histories. So all of those, uh, you know, you can just imagine 45,000 barriers, barriers to housing, barriers to jobs, barriers to school, barriers to child reunification, barriers to licensing. Um, I mean, 45,000 barriers. That's, you know, instead of 45,000 opportunities. Once a person leaves the, the prison and their debt is paid, they should not be continued to be punished at the cost of the taxpayer for on a monetary level, but also actually also at the cost of the gifts and the talents that they're able to put back into the world, put back into the communities in their children's lives and what have you. Um, so you would like to see, you would like to see the whole system reformed. Nonviolent offenders not going to jail is that? I would is like that to the see the solution. I would see. I would like to see the criminal justice system as it exists to be dismantled from a punitive approach and created for as a as a rehabilitative approach only for the most um, harmful individuals that really cause the community that are really a threat to the safety of, of our communities. So I just wouldn't put it on a violent and a nonviolent sort of um, approach. And I think that <clears throat> sometimes people are pushed into ways to become violent. It's only by the grace of God that I didn't get caught in some situation where it would have been deemed a violent situation and I would have been a violent, labeled violent for the rest of my life. So I think that we really just need to look at how we're approaching things, but the prison system makes people worse than they were when they got there. You have a much damaged, per more damaged person leaving than coming.
Thank you so much. Thank you for your book. Thank you for your time. All right. That's it for this edition of To the Contrary. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie or Bay or at To the Contrary and go to our website, pbs.org slash To the Contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next week. transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS.